Welcome back to Masters of Modern. I am your host, Alex Kessler, here with a special co-host guest, Zach Allen. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Jumping yeah, right thanks for it. having me, man. Yeah, for sure. So for those, uh, for, for listeners uh, and watchers, uh, Ben is at Atlanta this week uh, for the very first toy show. Uh, so that's cool. Um, but uh, so so thankfully, uh, Zach was able to fill in and jump in. He's been playing a lot of modern recently, wanted to talk about it. And I needed a, a, a co-host that knew what he was talking about. So this is a perfect, perfect combo. How's it going? <laughs> Yeah, man. Happy to be here. Uh, really excited to talk about Modern. You're right. I've been playing way more of it than I normally would have been recently, but I can't help it. I'm finally allowed to play paper again, so I'm doing it. Yeah, it's been really cool. Like even our like just from a viewership number perspective, which I'm realizing is a weird barometer for how popular modern is at a different time of year. Mm. <laughs> um, and I didn't expect that until COVID kind of showed like exactly that graph. Um, but yeah, like I think with Modern Horizons 2 coming out. Uh, with Paper Magic coming back and Modern kind of being the Paper Magic format more than any other version of playing Magic. other Because even Commander, because it's like spell table experience where that now that is almost a, a half a digital format anyways, like Modern is the one way of playing Magic that you just have to do in Paper, really. I mean, you can play a Moto, you can do other things, but like the most often played way is in that way. And now that Paper Magic is back, people are playing yeah, I definitely agree. And I mean, to your point, like Commander is the most played format, but you could have played Commander during quarantine, right? Like if you had two friends that, you know, you all had been quarantined, you could play with two friends. It was easy to do. It's really hard to have a modern tournament when there's a mass sickness going around, right? So right. Um, people, you know, there aren't real big tournaments back yet, but we're starting to get small local ones in places where, you know, the vaccine rates are high enough and um i've been able to play around me at a couple places so it's been just amazing to get back to it you know yeah absolutely it was like kind of like it was like right when everyone hit their like two weeks after their second shot or mm -hmm. whatever we like did a big even just like a draft and it was like oh right i like really love this game <laughs> and yep. kind of like forgot how much i loved playing this game 1v1 uh over quarantine but like playing paper with real people and hanging out with people is like such a nice experience that like right that's why i keep referring to magic as the best game of all time because arena does not have all like some some of parts of arena are great the fact that i basically can play limited at any time at any day anywhere in the world is amazing but it's not the same as playing magic in person so it's it's been really nice coming back and then obviously modern being one of the best formats of all time being back has also been really great yep um so very quickly before we jump into mod all things modern uh two things first off uh if you are watching this you should hit that like button down there that's how you make it so this video does better. So it's up to you to help this video. Uh, also, uh, there is a link below. If you are a person who shops on TCG Player at any time, if you click on a link below, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you don't have to put a code in. You don't have to even remember it. Just by clicking on that link, uh, TCG Player will know that we sent you at some point. And if you buy something from them, they help us out. So it's a great little way to support the podcast that costs you nothing. You don't even have to buy anything right now. You just have to click on the link and, and TCG Player will remember using the power of code cookies and who doesn't love those uh, <laughs> um beyond that uh just really quickly zach well, can you just tell people about yourself well what's your experience in modern what's your content creator experience what are you doing right now where can people find you on the internet etc uh yeah absolutely so uh in terms of my experience in modern uh i'm a player on the scg tour which i think you can say is the biggest modern circuit there are bigger modern tournaments like modern pro tours, but in terms of like consistent modern tournaments, there's not a bigger circuit than the SCG tour. And as of right now, I'm number one on the leaderboard. Uh, that's kind of influenced by the fact the leaderboard has been paused for over a year due to play stoppage, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of making content, uh, I did a podcast called turn one thought sees for about two years, uh, with a co-host Aaron. Uh, and I love that podcast. Um, but then I wanted to focus more on playing and improving my game. So I took a little break, uh, started doing pretty well on the tour. Then we made another podcast called Up to Date MTG. I did it with Harlan Fear, who was one of my teammates who uh, we won a bunch of tournaments together. Um, and that was going great. And then COVID hit and everything died. It was really hard to keep everything going together. So we're on hiatus right now. But whenever tournaments do resume again, you'll be able to find whatever modern deck I'm playing at the next SCG on that podcast. And 
Yeah, I don't know. In terms of modern, like it's the format I play more than any other, and it's the one I dedicate to because it's just the one I love the most. I don't know how else to put it. It's it's the thing I can play tournaments here, and for me, it's I, I don't know. It's just the it's the one I just dedicate so much time to. You know? Oh yeah. It's also probably the one that benefits the most in depth time commitment. I mean, excluding like the legacies and the vintages of the world where finding consistent tournament play just doesn't exist. Um, Like of the formats where you can find tournaments regularly, it's the one that like, oh, being a master at this is helpful. If I'm a master at standard and then I stop playing for six months, that skill set is gone. And not the entire skill set, like because obviously the ability to get good at magic is still there. But like you don't know what cards are good. You don't you couldn't build a deck from scratch. You have the net kick and then just rest on your laurels. But uh, with modern, like you can you can put the time in and then like step away and even come back and be able to like set in a table and know what's going on. Now that's changed a little bit over the last two years, which will be a little bit of the conversation later on in the episode on just like how rapid the format has changed since basically mm-hmm. war of the spark. But it, it, like, they're still junt. <laughs> yeah. uh, it does something different slightly, but it's still there. Uh, and, and there's other kind of just key established stuff and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's super. And then you were, cause Corey Burkhart's been on this, 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 the, the podcast a few times. You were also on a team with him for a while, right? Oh, yeah. So I guess I missed it. I play for Team R.I.W. I'm sponsored by them. Uh, and uh, yes, Corey is on my team. Uh, Ari Lax was on my team as well. He's a former Pro Tour winner. Um, and I've had different teammates throughout. It's kind of moved around. But Max McVitie has been on the team. Um, and we've had you know just some other players from the store. But uh, great team. A lot of excellent players. I definitely credit just learning from Corey and Ari specifically uh, as, you know, helping me a lot, just seeing their work ethic, how they approach formats, how they learn that type of stuff. So uh, really beneficial for me. I'm just lucky to come from a store that has produced like crazy good players that, you know, kind of some of that benefits me because I get to, you know, learn from them and play with them and that kind of stuff. Sure. 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 It's, it's crazy also how like that can help. Like even our podcast, like the team East West Bowl. So like Andrew Brown yep. and, and, and all those guys like all played out of our store. Like we all just like used to hang out at each other and like they sure. went into like, we're going to be pros now. And we were like, I'm going to make content because I have all this equipment from top decking and I'm much better at talking sure. about magic than playing it. Um, but like it's it's interesting how like, yeah, communities can really build that even like like that of that group, like Jules Robbins now is was the lead set designer for for a Forgotten Realm, the magic set. Andrew Brown is obviously designer of wizards now. Yep. And yeah, national Modern probably like all, all this stuff that actually came from it, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sweet. Um, and then, and then, yeah. So welcome, welcome to the podcast. You want to talk about some modern? I'm here. Let's do it. All right. So modern horizons has been out for about, I want to say about a month, but I don't know how time works anymore. Yep. So it might be no, a it's week. about a month. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it might be, it might be, it, had, it might have came out yesterday. Spoiler season's fast. Um, and True. the That's metagame has been truth. heavily influenced by it uh, in, in a way that feels safer than when Modern Horizons 2 or 1 came out. Um, though that was also weird because Modern, both are coming out in weird moments, right? Like Modern Horizons came out right after War of the Spark and right before Throne of Eldraine, which are two of the most powerful sets. Yeah, and and then itself was yep. one of the most powerful sets, and then this is coming out kind of at the 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 first time people are playing modern in any real way since Ikoria, Rise of Zendikar, kind of Theros Beyond Death to some extent, and uh, Kaldheim have come out. So like they both are coming out in this weird moment where like the metagame looks very different and has shifted a lot because of this. Though I question a little bit on like how much is that Modern Horizons two and how much of that is four sets worth of cards have now been introduced to people playing this format again seriously for the first time in a year. So yeah, so we live in a new world uh, and and kind of the first step is like, what what from your perspective, what are the best decks right now? Um, I think you can make a pretty good argument that the best two decks by far are red delirium based decks and those come in a decent amount of flavors, but I'm gonna group them all together for the sake of best deck. And Hammer Time, which is a surprising one, but has just been putting up numbers left and right and seems to be unstoppable at the moment. Um, And then past that, we do have uh, Amulet Titan putting up some big results. Um, And there's some food strategies, some food strategies that were kind of really dominant right when the set dropped and have fallen off a little bit, but have kind of come back around, I guess. 
Um, we can dig more into the food. I'd put that definitely a tier below Hammer Time, Delirium, and Amulet at the moment, but I think that one has potential because some of the stuff in those decks just feels really broken. Um, but yeah, the, the Red Delirium decks, and those ones are powered strictly by Modern Horizons 2. There's... Uh, the, the decks just would not exist without the set. They're mostly from the set, and they're very, very, very strong. Hammer Time is, like, mostly not from Modern Horizons 2. It just got one big piece, but that piece has been huge, so... Right, like, uh, we'll see. Megavan plus Dragon Rage Channeler is, like, a big part of just making that that mono... Re- or the red the red Delirium decks work, right? Like, that's that's brought... And then the the, the new removal spell, right? The two-mana... Yeah, I, don't know I, the name of. I was gonna say, it's, it's Unholy Heat, too. Like, that is such a big thing, because for ever in modern red just could not kill the big thing like you played a five five and the red decks would just stare at it right right and now it's like i just have swords to plot shares in red and they don't even gain the life so it's interesting where between that and uh as you have a situation where like a creature with a seven tough with seven toughness actually might be a premium in the format at the moment. Like that's the only thing that survives yeah. removal. <laughs> Where like before, no, you're not be, wrong. like four drops because they dodged abrupt decay and and or five drops because they dodged uh, fatal push. But yeah, it's it's interesting how I think me and Michael, who's who was one of the other co-hosts of the podcast, like just like started looking through X sevens <laughs> and we're like yeah. are any of these playable? And sadly, most of them are not. <laughs> um, no. But yeah, no. uh, like that's, and that's, I think one of the reasons as more decks were so, or the food decks were so dominant at the beginning of the thing was just like, Oh, we now have to deal with the fact that if I have a creature in play, it either has to have gotten me the value out of it in a way that as doesn't just shut me down or it has to dodge as in some way. Um, yeah. And and that's kind of what you're seeing where they're either being hyper aggressive or they're able to get rid of it. So, yeah, it's it's been OK. So 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 that's the Lyrium decks. Hammer time decks have been around basically since. Um, Zendikar, I, I feel like in the format, we've been seeing those decks in the top tables, not Zendikar, yeah. Zendikar rising. I, I realize there yeah. are now four sets set in that plane. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, and obviously takes advantage of the fact that you have a very inexpensive hammer that you can equip to people uh, pretty efficiently. But uh, what are your thoughts on those decks? Well, so Hammer Time was always just a meme before. It was just like this joke deck that like was trying to circumvent this ridiculous equip cost on Colossus Hammer. It cost like eight to equip and it had multiple ways to do it. And that was powerful, but it, it just was too inconsistent, too... Mimi, I guess like it was cute but like it just didn't have the cohesiveness the staying power it needed and like the thing it needed to come together was like a really specific like really specific thing and it had to be like a really powerful card too because like you needed something to put all the pieces together that also like would give you random bodies to use all your equipment with and it's like there aren't cards like that wizards doesn't make cards like that and then they printed Urza's Saga. And now all of a sudden this deck has everything it needs. It can find the artifact it needs always, which is this hammer. Or sometimes it's a thing to give Trample and a Shadow Spear maybe. Um, but also you can just put bodies in play. And you just have this fair beatdown plan in case they are trying to, you know, beat your quick call. Or like, you know, maybe Stony Silence you or shatter your artifacts, whatever it is. Well, my land makes two guys. I'm fine. I'll just attack. Right, right. And that one card like i've i've never seen one card just shoot a deck into just the top tier of a modern metagame so quickly like saga did for hammer time i guess i don't know i feel like that has happened in the past where they like print a card well yeah i mean but yes, I was gonna, yeah yeah I, I, I guess i could say hogak and then yeah that would make a lot of right, sense right like the sure. decks were terrible as much as i tried yeah. making them happen for a good 10 years and then <laughs> Um, and then Hogak gets printed and then Vengevine is the best card of the format. Uh, but yep. there's there's definitely yeah, there, there's definitely something to be said for Urza Saga putting this all together. And it, it kind of plays like Affinity used to in the sense that like, yeah, you you have this main piercing formation game plan of getting either cranial plating or hammer on something and just swinging at something for really inexpensive, like for an expensive threat. Or Mm -hmm. like late game options of just, yeah, going wide, winning with Ink Moth Nexus if you can't get through with something else and and even a value engine with Pure Steel Paladin. So this deck, this deck definitely also helped by Luros being able to like want late game by threats that they're able to answer has has really cool staying power. That was the big point on the deck you just hit on, though, is that this deck has a staying engine, whereas Affinity never did. Affinity was always a great deck, but you could certainly beat Affinity with a pile of Ancient Grudges if you wanted to. 
Um, that doesn't necessarily work against this deck. It can, but it's not. It doesn't necessarily work. If they get Lurus plus Pure Steel Paladin going, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Right. Yeah. You have you have both the options of Pure Steel Paladin or Lurus, just like drawing them into great combos. And those cards are really good on their own. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this this it's like it's cool how all of these equipment pieces finally kind of came together. And between Urza Sog and Steel Shaper's Gift and Stoneforge Mystic you have like a very thorough tutor package. Like you're never not going to have the card you need. And all of those are extremely efficient ways to get those. Yeah. Playing against the deck, you like, it's almost frustrating how often they have hammer. And then you look at the deck, you're like, Oh, every card of the deck finds hammer. Of course they always have it. Right. Right. They're playing four, eight, 12, 16, like tutor options for, yep. <laughs> well, 12 tutor options for hammer and then four hammers. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then that doesn't even include the fact that like an additional cranial plating and shadow sphere, like additional, these are basically hammers. And then Loros who lets you rebuy the tutors that you maybe were able to answer. Yeah. I can, I can imagine why this deck is consistent now. <laughs> yep. And that's, and that's kind of the point, right? That's like, we, we've always kind of said on this podcast that, redundancy is maybe the most important thing for a strategy to be able to survive. Like the more glass candidate it is, the more that if it can be redundant, the it, the more likely it is to succeed. One of the reasons Splinter Twin was able to succeed is because they had eight different targets hit with Splinter Twin that were also able to transition to, into attacking threats. And this yep. takes that transition itself where it's like, I'm going to get my combo no matter what. And yep. therefore the fact that my combo is a little shallow or like I'm all in on this one idea isn't that big of a deal. All right. Now, number three, we were, we've talked about red delirium hammer time. Uh, let's talk amulet. Let's let's primeval Titan, which may there's probably arguments is the best creature in modern history <laughs> just for the amount of times it's gone. Yeah. It's banned. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I could buy it. There's maybe a few you could argue, but it just has never been banned. So it just has this consistent streak of dominance. Right. It like it like is always there. It's randomly maybe not good enough, but it's by itself pound for pound. The reason decks are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, so 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 what's happened with Amulet Titan? I mean, Urza Saga being able to find find amulets obviously is a significant win. But what else? What else has it got going for it now? I mean, it's just that, which is weird to say. Like, there, certainly there are other things that the deck has gotten. There's other things going on with the deck, but it really is just that that is vaulting it up into this top tier. And it seems like a small thing, but when you really look at the deck, everything is built around lands putting together pieces the deck needs. I mean, whether it be you know, historically, Simic Growth Chamber plus Teleria West bouncing and getting you a Summoner's Pack so your lands can physically get you a Primeval Titan. And forever, the one thing your lands couldn't do was get you Amulet of Vigor. It was the only thing the lands couldn't do. It could get you anything else you wanted always in the deck, but you couldn't get Amulet Vigor, and that was the one card you always wanted. It was the best card. Right, right. And then they printed this one, and it was like, oh my goodness. Like, your land, like, you now essentially have eight amulets in the deck because you... If you had amulet, like amulets in your opening hand, you could kill them on turn two or whatever. But an Urza Saga in your hand means you have an amulet on turn three. And an uncounterable one at that, which is also kind of big. Right. And just that, just having eight amulets, this is just what you said. Like, the deck was good before, but, like, you had to really, you had to really scrape and, like, kind of figure out games where you didn't have an amulet. It was just... I, you had to put weird stuff together and figure out how to not die and, like, utilize, like, a bajuka bog and a radiant fountain to, like, buy yourself one turn... But now you just have eight copies of Amulet in your deck, so you're very likely to have one in your starting hand after one mulligan. You're like plus 90% after one mulligan to have one of these in your hand. And because of that, you just have access to faster and more consistent Titans, and that's all the deck wants anyway. So right. that was all you needed. And, and, and the fact that like Urza's Saga gives you kind of what you need before you get to that third land or the before like a you get amulet on the turn you need it right it's turn three yep. that's the turn that like you're gonna have enough land drops by playing other cards to get primeval titan into play and then you yep. go off so like you kind of don't need it as much like it's nice to have it on turn two because you like some of your lands won't come into play on tap so you can move before it a little bit and then urza saga on the other side like is great at stalling in the meantime, making two, two, three yeah. artifact threats that block all day to make it so you don't die to random attacking delirium creatures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ragavans, no. uh, Ragavans, uh, is, is a nice, is a nice little bonus point for it. So yeah, it's, it's, I, 
Go I will say in my testing with Amulet, Raghavan is actually a very big problem for this deck. And I have been advocating to many people, like, you need to be playing Arboreal Grazer right now. The card looks bad, but it blocks Raghavan, so put it in your deck. Sure, sure. No, um, that, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, like, or go to red and, like, add something that, like, gut shots. But, like, that, sure, Arbo yeah. Arboreal Grazer sounds like the easiest like card you can go up on pretty easily yep. and shuts out one of the largest threats in the format if not the the most played threat is it the most played it is the most played threat in the format yep that makes yep. sense but then uh, past that too like amulet was broken at points during quarantine because it got to use field of the dead and even before that like control decks prior could beat amulet pretty easily by just killing all four of their titans like it wasn't that hard to do you just four path exiles and titan lost right 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 um then they added Field of the Dead, and now all of a sudden Control could never win to save its life. It got banned because it was too good. That makes sense. Well, now I have this tutor for Amulet on turn one that late game is basically Field of the Dead for me. It's just so good. It's just everything the deck wanted. Yeah, it's 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 among all the other cards that it's been able to get. And like the other one, I guess, is Abundant Harvest. That's like the other piece main deck, at least, that it's gotten yep. from, which is just... A better cantrip than I always want to say ancestral visions, but it is ancient stirrings. Ancient stirrings. Thank ancient, you. Yep. I knew it's an A and an S. <laughs> yep. um, and so, like before, you would find a card you need, but it'd have to be an artifact. Like you can never find Titan. Now you have the ability to like yep. find the creatures or the green cards you might want, or a land. And and the lands are so powerful that that helps there. Um, I'm trying to see if yep. there's anything in the sideboard, at least in this list, that seems. Yeah, the uh, foundation breaker, which is which is kind of a card that has moved up recently as one of the more played cards, which is just yeah, evoke evoke um disenchant or the green one. Yeah, I mean it's foundation breaker is good, but it's not like a huge update or upgrade over reclamation stage. It's mm -hmm. just you know it's better, so you play it. But whatever, like that isn't integral to the deck's success by any means. Um, I would actually argue, uh, just like getting the extra green cards from Abundant Harvest, from Grazer, from being only like being only mono green lets you more effectively use Force of Vigor. So it, it, it became a better Force of Vigor deck with the Abundant Harvest being in there, which seems minor, but ends up really mattering when your deck is like 0% to ever beat a Blood Moon and like pretty favored when they're not playing Blood Moon, I guess. Right, right. That makes yeah. sense. Um, all right. The last deck we wanted to talk about before getting into some specifics or, or going back to some is, is the food decks is, you know, as more and all of the cards alongside have come in and been able to do yep. some really cool stuff. It's, it's kind of like the weird, I did a poll last week of like, what is the best card servo food? And that was the best card. What is the best of these options? The best junk sure. piece, which is treasures, food, servos and clues. And it was an interesting poll. Like treasures won by like a wide, wide margin, but I think that had more to do with like what cards things are on. And food, sure. people were like, food is not good, but food is so bad that they have allowed cards that utilize food to be too pushed. Sure. Where it's like it's almost like they undervalued having artifact tokens so much that they just were like, okay, so let's just let like free seven, six versions of Vengevine take advantage of it. And let's like have a free one drop can't tripping discard outlet, <laughs> make them for yeah. free. Um, and yep. it's like, Oh, th right. The, uh, these are things that are good. <laughs> Yeah, you, you would have thought they would have figured that one out with Oko, but no, we've got more food problems here in Modern now. But is it is it a problem? It was interesting because definitely, I mean, we're going to have a conversation on, about bannings, but like the my sure. like hot take after like week one of Modern Horizons being out was like everyone's pointing at Urza Saga as the card that needs banned, but I think it's possible Asmore is the card. And it's because... Urza, and, and, and I'm not even saying that now because it is falling out of favor, but from a from a like funness of the format perspective, Urza Saga seems to be creating more archetypes and decks that are possible to be played sure. while Asmore seems to be locking decks out of the format and, and creating game states that are less fun. Uh, and, and that often yeah. is something that wizards is like, Ooh, we don't like that. It's fine. If like, and like Urza Saga could be banned on like the, and we, I guess we're not, but we're ADDing into the banned conversation. We'll wait that. We'll, we'll save that for later. All right. So <laughs> that's fair, that's let's fair. talk about food decks. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the food decks have come out and no one has the right shell for these yet. As far as I'm concerned, um, there's been, 
I want to say three, four, maybe even five different shells. There's definitely a blue black shell that uses Urza, uh, Asmore, Emery. So you got these 12 legends. You get some Mox Ambers, some Underworld Cookbooks, Oval Chase Daredevil. And you're just using food tokens as basically artifact that synergizes with other things. Like the fact that their food doesn't matter. It's just that you have something that makes type artifact and all of your other cards benefit from that essentially. Um, they've played that same shell in blue red. I've seen it in blue red to get access to better removal spells for the deck, namely unholy heat. Um, because you can play all those same legends in blue red because as more as a hybrid card. Um, I've seen it in green black. I've seen it in Jund. Green black is way different. It's not the same deck at all. Green black is, um, still using as more, but it's more actually food based with like gilded goose and trail of crumbs and sometimes witches oven plus the, the little kitty. And, and that, I do that, like, and those are the ones that are playing the troll king, right? They, some of them are, some of them are not. Okay. And, um, I personally think the troll king is bad in the deck. Sure. Um, but it definitely is explosive. So there are, I mean, there are times where it just feels really, really unfair. Um, but then you also just play into the opponent's graveyard hate a lot more, which I don't really love. So I, it, and that deck doesn't need it. Like when you're playing trail of crumbs, like you don't need to play into graveyard hate. You can just win just playing your spells and grinding stuff out. So that is really, I mean, that is a real, uh, place to go. And then I've seen that that same list in Jun, like you know, same green black splicing some Jun stuff, maybe a mayhem double here or there, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean these food archetypes are all over the place, and they all feel powerful. And you're right, Asmore has game states against certain decks where it just feels completely unbeatable. It just feels like you're never beating this card under any circumstances. But it needs some things to go right before that's the case. I will say that sure. because the engine that's powering basically all of these decks is the fact that. Underworld Cookbook requires you to discard a card, and if that was just what the card did, like if there wasn't a loop with it like there is, it just wouldn't be that good in my opinion. It'd just be fine, but the fact that there's a card that exists called Oval Chase Daredevil that when an artifact enters the battlefield, if it's in your graveyard, you can return it to your hand. So basically, Underworld Cookbook, if this is in your hand, just is tap, make a food. Right. That's what it turns into. That's what makes Asmore broken. Like, if you were actually discarding two cards to make two foods to kill one of their guys, like, you're 2 for yourself, that would be probably not even that good, just a sure. reasonable card. Um, but because you have this loop, it does become powerful. And um, I actually... Let me go out on a, on a tangent here, because I hate something that's going on in this deck, and I just want to let people know why I hate it and why I think this specific aspect of the blue-black deck is wrong and I think people should switch. Um, because of the thing I just described to you where the deck is awesome when you have the Oval Chase Oven or Underworld Cookbook thing going and not awesome when you don't, um, every list I see is playing this called, card called Thought Monitor, which is a the new Affinity Thought Cast from Modern Horizons. And it's a really powerful card. If you have six artifacts in play, it's a one-mana draw two on a 2-2 two, two flyer. That's an awesome card, right? Um, but when you have six artifacts in play with this deck, you're winning. You already have Oval Chase, Daredevil, and Underworld Cookbook going on. Why do we need the 2-2 two, two to draw us cards? I want to draw my, my Oval Chase, Daredevil, so that I can get this engine online. Like, when the engine's not online, the deck does not function. It does not work. It kind of does, but it really doesn't. Um, so I would advocate anybody playing Thought Monitor in your deck, take a second, slow down, go back to, I believe, Kaladesh, look up a card called Reverse Engineer, Put that in your deck instead and profit big time because uh, Reverse Engineer draws three for two mana in this deck, but it can do it before your engine's online, which is really important. That's what you're looking for, and it helps you find the Oval Chase Daredevil to get your Asmore going, to get your Urza to spots for making broken mana, all of that stuff. So I would advocate for that. Um, so for, 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 those, for, those, for, for audio-only listeners, uh, for like random uncommon from... Uh, uh, Kaladesh. It's three blue blue sorcery. Improvise. Your artifacts can cast this spell. Each artifacts you tap after you're uh, done activating the mana abilities uh, pays for one. So it's it's uh, um, you can convoke. tap your artifacts for mana. It's convoke, but with artifacts you can't use for colored mana, I don't think. Or can you? No, it's not colored. Yeah, it's, yeah, only it's, the colorless. it's only colorless. It's only colorless. And it's so it ends up being uh, blue blue draw three cards. Um, which I played a crap ton of this card in standard cheerios but sure. <laughs> um uh definitely definitely yeah so you're you're just able to get it online a lot like on turn 
two to three a lot more easily yeah. than, than Thought well, Monitor. Thought Monitor requires six artifacts. I guess five if you're being technical, because then it's one and a blue, which is the same cost here. But it's hard to get to that number early. You have to discard so many cards from your hand with Cookbook to get up to that point. And if you don't have the Daredevil, like you're actually paying for that. Um, but the three is like easy. You can get to three. You can play a Cookbook. You can discard one card. You can put your Mistress Bobble in play. I got three. Perfect. I'm gonna cast my draw three, and I'm I found my Daredevil, and now we're all in line, and we're moving. You know what I mean? Sure. I do. I do think Emery offers like a oval chase daredevil light, right? Cause you're able to discard an artifact. And then if, as long as Emery is in play, use Emery to play that artifact that you discard from your graveyard as if it was in your hand, you are losing the value of getting to use Emery and oval chase daredevil food in the play. And I'm not, I'm not disagreeing between the thought monitor and, 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 um, reverse engineering. But I do think that for people learning the deck, that's another option is, is, and kind of probably the more common, backup yeah. plan to to not having your herbal chase daredevil is using emery as like a pseudo discard mitigator yeah well it goes the other way too because if your emery mills the oval chase then anything that puts an artifact in play comes back to your hand and you're good already sure, so sure it does go both ways there um and i've also when i've brought up this reverse engineer argument to people in the past they always tell me well you can't cast your reverse engineer out of your graveyard with emery but i can cast my thought mind out of the graveyard with emery so it's really it's better and then I tell them, well, you have an Emery online. Like, th- again, this is not the problem. You're already winning. You're, if your Emery is drawing you a card every turn with Mistress Bobble, you're going to win. Like, that's how that's how this deck is built. You just right. out-resource people. Your point is, at all points where Thought Monitor is decent or better than or better than reverse engineering, you're already doing well. <laughs> you, yeah. You've already you've already got there. So um, I, I guess there's then maybe there's a, a conversation on like, is there just something better to play versus just like random card draw effect, um, which which I think also is maybe a metagame call, right? Like how grindy is it? Yeah. What are you facing against? Because I, I can see reverse engineering also being a better card in the mirror match when you like playing creatures aren't as good as having ways to fight off an Asmore. Yep. No, I mean, y- you could be right there and you're right. It's always going to be metagame dependent. So y- you're, you're right. Um, but I-, I think right now I'd rather just be able to like modern's really fast right now. We just talked about how fast these delirium decks are. Um, we talked about how fast hammer time is in amulet. Now that it has eight amulets, um, <laughs> I, I think you just need to be fast and thought monitor is not fast in the deck. It's just, it's good, but it's not fast. And reverse engineer is kind of fast, I guess. Um, if you wanted to be even faster, I guess you could play thought cast. That makes some sense to me, but I still think reverse engineer is better. So I, I don't know. Right. You, and you don't um, have the backup plan of just like a two, two that can block or, or yep. get in there at that point. And so it's not that much more efficient. Um, you're like drawing less cards for one less mana. Which is often the norm. That's normally what happens, I guess, with card draw. Now that yeah. I think about it, <laughs> normally it's like for one ever extra mana, you draw one extra card. But um, so, 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 kind of, I guess to summarize your point, though, with food decks, there's one of the problems they're facing is more like there's not a good total understanding on which one of these is maybe the best, and maybe the point yep. is that that because they are going to be the best one in different situations. The conversation of saying the food deck is the best deck in the format is hard to say because it's actually not one deck. It's just three different decks yeah. that are like jockeying to be which one's the best. And there's never going to be kind of like the best one. Is there, is there weaknesses that these, like what, which of, of the three other decks, like in a rock, paper, scissors format, which ones are kind of bad matchups for food? Okay. So the red decks are bad. They're really bad. And it looks like it looks like you should be good, right? You brought up this point about Asmore like destroying creatures decks, but no, the red decks just always have a kill spell for Asmore. You even if you can like get it in play and then like kill one thing, okay, that's great, but they probably have a Merktide region in play that's an eight eight, and you can't kill that, and Asmore doesn't kill it, and now your Asmore's dead, and what are you doing to this eight eight? You're dead. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um so the 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 blue and black decks are slower right now, especially because they're built with thought monitors. So they really struggle with the faster decks. And in a grindier format, they get better and better because this is also a deck that's using Urza's Saga. And it's very good at grinding. So it gets better as it gets grindier. The green black decks are lower to the ground. Um, and they can, they're lower to the go- ground and also good at grinding. So they can compete with these fast decks, but they are really bad against unfair decks. So when you're playing against 
a deck that's doing some cascade shenanigans or a deck that's like storm or something, just somebody doing something really unfair. The green black decks are just, they, they've just gone so all in on like cheap cards that grind. that They just don't have room for interaction for those kind of decks. Sure. And then they just don't make relevant game actions. And then the, the deck doing the, you know, the unfair thing just beats them easily. So, you know, if you're playing a storm dedicated metagame or a, Cascade Glimpse of Tomorrow, I think the card is called, that kind of metagame. You probably don't want to play the green-black version, um, but the green-black version in a fair metagame is awesome. The blue the blue versions are better against those like really unfair decks because you can play counter spells, you can play Metallic Rebuke, you can play you know these other things that are going to help against those decks, um, and that's good. So for, you know, for all of those... They kind of are both going to be good at grinding, but they're better against you know different aspects of the unfair or the the, the faster decks, I guess I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think there's room to experiment. I think the blue decks at some point are going to find a Thopter Foundry sort of the meat combo to go with Urza. I'm not sure what that looks like. I haven't been able to find a list I like, but I think at some point we're going to find a list that looks like that. And then I think the green decks are going to transform into Dredge, which sounds crazy. Sure. No, 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 that more makes sense. Yeah, the more I'm looking at it, Dredge has always been really powerful, but it doesn't have good one man and enablers since um, Faithless Looting got banned, and Unreal Cookbook's like the best one man enabler Dredge has had in a long time. I wouldn't be shocked if you know two months from now you see a, a, a Dredge deck popping up using Underworld Cookbook and it's just busted. Right, I would not be stunned. But also like uh, especially the ones with Troll King that I have seen, they have yep. Hogak vibes. Like not yeah. necessarily even dredge, but if you're playing cookbook and cat and oven and the uh, I'm always forget this because there's like 18 different altars, but altar the one that's legal and modern <laughs> that yep. sacrifice and mills yourself uh, altar of delirium, not delirium dementia dementia. Thank you. Um, yep. And uh, is like like using troll king to sack you know seven cards and put them in and get them into your library off of altar of dementia is like a lot of cards to go into your deck in your graveyard that you got off of like really good enablers that you can start looping and get cards going i yeah i I agree that like that deck leans more and more i think i think the 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 limitation there is and that's kind of limitation you brought up with troll king right is that like yeah graveyard deck hate is good uh well if it's so good, if people are playing it you're gonna have a bad time if people aren't you're going to punish them <laughs> so you're right about that but i actually kind of like the idea there where it's like i hate being really reliant on the graveyard but also not being like broken with your graveyard strategy right right if that right. makes sense because dredge like just does this unfair thing that's like broken and fair decks aren't beating it but then you play graveyard hate and the deck folds right so at least you got the game one and then game two comes down to can you answer their graveyard hate the other deck like the other deck is like well maybe you got game one but like what you're doing wasn't broken anyway and then they bring in graveyard hate and even if you answer it like you're not even locked to win so like I, I don't know. I, yeah. I'd rather go harder towards the graveyard, I guess. Right. If you're going, if you're going to be taking advantage of the graveyard to the extent that graveyard hate is going to be good against you, you might as well be dumb and broken yeah. and not like, yep. like really go into it and let the graveyard hate go for you, so that your game two sideboard plan is like, I win if I draw my en- enchantment removal. <laughs> yep. Like, did I draw disenchant? I win again. If I didn't, I lose. And that's how I'm just yeah. going to have to live my life. Um, yeah, I think I agree with that. I think, yeah, like seeing if those decks can lean farther in that direction. I like, I think that that definitely looks like it's possibly the future. Um, and then the last deck you kind of have listed here that you wanted to go over is the Cascade decks. Um, there are a lot of Cascade decks. Um, we're looking at Glimpse of Tomorrow, which is like the very unfair one. I think I don't even know what the card it's referenced. I think it's like World F- Purge or World Fire or something. A warp World. Um, warp World. Thank you. It's a one-sided I warp think that, World. Yeah, yeah. Where you just like shuffle. You shuffle every permanent in that is on the battlefield into your library, and then put that many permanents from your library into play after you shuffle everything in. Uh, which basically you play a bunch of things like food tokens and things that aren't real permanents that you can get really easy. So you have a large number of permanents. And then when you cast this thing, now all of a sudden those permanents that didn't do anything are like Emrakul and Iona. Right. And it's, you, it's, you know, uh, you're done. We finally have hypergenesis legal in the format. Yep. And it's kind of, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is hypergenesis, but also it's like a hypergenesis that like requires a lot more setup. Whereas hypergenesis was just like, 
turn two Emrakul go. You know, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, we're not. It's not. Yeah. It's not degenerate at the level of hypergen because like forever living index were hypergenesis decks, right? Like it was yep. the exact kind same of, yeah. shell, uh, except instead of playing control pieces, you were playing cantrip or cycler creatures and living and got you all of them into play versus cheating you know it uh, uh uh basically being the show and tell version of of the format we now mm-hmm. have a show and tell version we now have the version that's like yeah. i'm cheating a big thing into play and you have to deal with an emerald which classically people they can't, can't. <laughs> no they can't they can't they're done hey i've um, i've i've I don't think I've actually survived being attacked by Emrakul. I'm trying to think. <laughs> in, in 10 years, has that ever happened? I, feel, I, ha- I have beaten it once. I know I've beaten it once. I think, like, I think I've, like, somehow, sort of, in po- I, it, it, I remember, it was in Legacy. So, Legacy Pox, I, they, like, attack with Emrakul. I'm down to five. I was able to survive, like, one land. But then I had uh, uh, Liliana and... Uh, 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 dark ritual in hand. And it was like all I had, or like I had dark ritual sure. in hand and like top decked in the Liliana. I was like, this is the only thing that could have saved me. And that was it. Uh, that's the one time. Well, Emrakul sure. kills you. <laughs> it says I win. It's a card that says I win on it. Uh, but yes. Yeah. So, so sorry, I can continue on, on the cascade deck train. Yeah, I was going to say that's, that's the unfair version. There's also a fair version where you play anywhere from eight to 12 cascade spells, depending on how greedy you want to get with your mana. And the only thing you cascade into is Crashing Footfalls, which is like, it's basically just three mana make two four four tramples, um, which is a really powerful card. Even in modern, that's a very powerful card. And then it's like, it's got the living end thing where like you can't play anything that costs less than three because then your cascade plan doesn't work. So you have to play all these weird cards that like are cheaper than three, but like don't actually have a CMC cheaper than three. Um, yeah, they've, they've so, printed enough things and they've changed the rules enough time that like the system is cheated and how it's related yep. to, so like bone crusher, like the adventure mechanic with bone crusher, giant and brazen bar, yep. where you have subtlety or subtlety, subtlety. I hate, yep. I hate reading cards. Uh, <laughs> fire, ice, fire ice is huge. Fire and ice, which is a big game. Cause it's like an actual good two mana spell, but because they changed yep. the rules with how double face cards, it no longer gets to cascade into it. And then force of negation, right? Like that's like yep. a ton of these cards are way less expensive than they look like they are. And then adding Charlotte's agent allows you to have like eight on color. You're not, you're no longer having to play five color decks non-embarrassing cascade spells where like before you had to play the black red one which kind of didn't do anything or the the um uh 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 the blue white one that like is an enchantment that enters the you know isn't isn't an an instant so you either have an instant speed crashing footfalls or you get 10 power into play with jarless agent yep yeah and those decks are great um and it's weird to me because both of them feel very powerful. They're both doing things that are very hard to interact with for decks that specifically aren't blue decks. And even the blue decks like need to have the counter spell on the turn that it's coming down, you know? Right. But it, it's weird because like they're both doing these super powerful things. And at the beginning of the format, they were kind of broken. But now all of a sudden, they're just not putting up the results anymore. And it's it's weird because it seems like they should be. So I was trying to I was kind of trying to figure out why it is, and it's I think, honestly, the answer is just, like, this is the deck people decided to attack. Because every list I looked at has Void Mirror. Every list I looked at has uh, Chalice of the Void in, like, decks that are all one-drops just to put it on zero against this deck. Or they have, like, uh, Engineered Explosives to clean up the Rhinos after they're in play. It's it's different, too, because Engineered Explosives is actually just a phenomenal sideboard card in the format because it hits all the food stuff as well. Um, so I think it's just suffering from the sideboard hate thing, which is weird because I don't know that you would expect like a fairer blue deck like that to be suffering from sideboard hate as badly, but I think this is going to become the affinity of the format in the sense that I guess even more than hammer time because hammer time is kind of like that too. But like if people are playing the sideboard cards for these decks, you really don't want to play these decks. And if they don't have them, you're going to have a great weekend, you know? Yeah, it, it feels partially, especially with the Crashing Footfall is one, that mm-hmm. the good sideboard cards against the other decks just also happen to be good against this deck. It's like, yeah. I like I don't feel bad playing 
void mirrors because like I know I'm going to face cascade decks. There's three different types of them. So this is good against multiple different archetypes in the format. Plus you like randomly will hit like a storm deck or whatever or other decks that take advantage. You have the like against the living end ones, just like good graveyard hate is always going to be bad for them. And then, sure. um, and then, yeah, the, specifically engineered explosives, not only is it good against the food decks, it's also just a good against the prowess decks. Like those decks are mostly yeah. one drops. So other than Merc Tide Regent, you can answer every threat in their deck with a with like amulets. So like not amulet, engineer explosives. So like there's a lot of things that that card is very good against. And the fact that like your only threat in the crashing footballs deck that you can get into play before turn four <laughs> is like just easily answered is not not the best. Um yep. and I think I think part of Part of it is also, and I think we're getting kind of close to the next question you had, was like, control decks always have problems in these moments. Like, when there is Mm -hmm. great shifts in a metagame, decks that are kind of more trying to be the deck that's answering what other people are doing are always going to do worse. There's a reason that, like, Mono Red Burn is the most pro like the the most top eight pro tours of all time have had of a deck is Mono Red Burn, and it's because... In a format where no one knows what's going on, being a control deck is really hard and being a burn deck is not as hard <laughs> because yep. what your opponent's doing doesn't matter. And like this is a deck that is kind of trying to, to be more of a control deck. It's using Brazen Borrowers and Bone Crushers, Fire Ices and Crypt. Like any deck that's playing Crypto Command is a control deck. <laughs> yep. No, you're right. <laughs> and and you're right. like, A, you don't always know what decks you're playing against, what are the important threats the answer, especially early on in the format? B, you just don't know what your like. Do you play four cryptic commands, two fire and ice? Do you play what you know? What what is the mix you're supposed to be playing to have the most likely chance to have the answers you need against the right decks at the right times? And I think that's something that also will be kind of at, like people will learn how to deal with moving forward. Sure, and no, I agree with you. And I mean, to your point on control, I'm actually. For uh, for the people that know me, they probably know me as a control player because I'm kind of, well, like almost all of my big finishes have come with control decks. I've had finishes with some other decks, but that's mostly what I am known for. And I love playing control in early formats because the puzzle is just so difficult. It's everything you said. Like, I have to get everything right, and I, I enjoy it when I do. But I'll tell you, I've had some really bad events early in formats where I thought I got it right, and I didn't, and that event did not go well for me. I will say... Another thing that I think is really holding back control decks right now is the the people that play control decks tend to love control decks. I know this because I love control decks and I play them. Um, And, you know, I have a lot of people the same thing. But uh, people that play control decks tend to love control decks. And we've been taught over the years that there's this, like, archetypal way to do control. It's like no creatures, one win con or no win cons or whatever it is. Tons of card draw and tons of answers, right? And then, you know, they started giving us better planeswalkers. And then so for the last, like three-ish years of modern it's just been reactive stuff and planeswalkers and that's for the most part been good enough so everyone right. that plays control kind of thinks that's how this works nowadays right but it doesn't work in this format modern horizons 2 has changed it the the creatures are just too much better unholy heat now kills your planeswalkers trying to protect a five mana to fairy is comical when they just like one just one mana kill it and they like mm. weren't even holding it up and the card was dead against you otherwise so it's like you turned a card, like a card that was dead into just one mana answer for your best card in your entire deck. That's not where you want to be, I promise, as a control deck. And I think people just need to like start looking at control in different ways. And that's why I do kind of like this Cascade deck because it is a control deck, but it's not doing the same things. And I actually think control decks just need to look different. And that's why they're not being successful right now because you can't be Planeswalker-based control decks in the world of Unholy Heat. Unless you put Chalice of the Void in your deck. And one of my friends has been experimenting with the Chalice of the Void control deck. And it's been absolutely excellent. So I can see Chalice of the Void control working. Uh, But if I wasn't going to do that, where you're playing a Chalice of the Void control deck, um, I would just not play Planeswalkers. And I think you just need to be instant speed based. Which to me means we're coming back to Archmage's Charm as card advantage. Maybe Factor Fiction, Snapcaster Mage, tons of removal spells. And I want to play on their turn. And I want their kill spells to actually be dead game one. I want them to board out Unholy Heat against me. I do, Like, when I'm playing against Control right now, I'm leaving Unholy Heat in with my red decks. And it's like, your Control deck's built wrong if I think that's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? Right. 
Well, it's also like, it, and when you look at like the classic rock, paper, scissors, volcano, whatever <laughs> you want to add, because magic is more than just three archetypes. But like when a Delver style deck is very good, often control mm-hmm. can have trouble with it because it's like I play a threat early and then I'm going to card advantage you with you. But my answers are about stopping your answers from doing anything. And yep. like correct me if I'm wrong, but based on the conversation we just had, it feels like you're leaning towards the blue red uh, delirium decks being the best deck in the format uh, yep. <laughs> or up there. And if the best deck is basically, this is a Delver list instead of playing Geist of St. Traft, you're playing Murktide Regents and it, or whatever, but you have like two one drop threats that are X ones that will kill you eventually. <laughs> once you have enough things going on or turn them on, they're just better than Delver of secrets. Which yep. is a crazy statement, but Modern Horizons introduced two cards that are better than Delver of Secrets. And, in well, Mo- and no, you, yeah. you're right, because forever, like in control, like good control players are taught, you want to just leave their one drops alone. You want to ignore them and you want to answer them later. And you want to just like let them sit there until you, you answer them on the right time period for you. You can't do that against Dragon's Race, Chandler, or Ragavan. You let them sit for like two turns and all of a sudden you just realize you are buried, you are out of this game and you're not coming back. Right, they're they're they printed two Delvers of Secrets that are card advantage engines. Yep. So like, you got to answer them now because <laughs> they're gonna do, they're gonna draw them three cards in the meantime. Ragavan's even worse than like it's a card advantage engine that's also ramping you. Like it's really <laughs> bad if you're letting that hit you. You can't do that as control. I I we uh I guessed it on the mental misplay uh mental misstep uh stream last week uh doing sure. the CDH gameplay and uh I happened of the four games we played drew uh Ragavan like turn one in two of them and it was the most unbeatable card I've ever and like and this is in CDH where like people are yeah. like storming off Thos you know what yeah Thos is oracling on turn two and I'm like I drew your Thos is Oracle so I won. <laughs> yeah. I'm like ramping myself six treasures in the amount of time you're doing anything and I did it off of this dumb one drop that you've ignored because yeah. it's CDH and no one plays creature removal. <laughs> and I'm like this yeah. card's busted. And yeah it's well, people- not- People just really underestimate how good, like, Llanowar Elf is. Just getting an Accelerant on turn one is so good in Magic nowadays. And green's the only color that does that. Like, red getting this on a threat that is also card advantage is, like, really absurd. It's a very, very strong effect for red to get. Yeah, so so, so I, I guess as we're talking about uh, the Delirium decks, why, it, I mean, beyond this, is, is this, what, what, are, what are some of the other reasons you think this is the best deck in the format? Okay, so there are two Delirium decks. There's Black Red and there's Blue Red. And I think Black Red is better at the moment because it wins the head-to-head in my experience. But the either could be better on any given weekend. And it, it comes down to both are playing Ragavan and Dragon's Rage Channeler because those cards are just so strong. And they're both playing Mishra's Bobble because it works with them. The question is, like, kind of what do you want your ancillary threats to be? And Murktide Regent... Is like a card that doesn't look like it would be that good in modern, right? Like it's it's just stats on a flying body, and it has no protection. It does have flying, but it doesn't draw you. A card. Like it doesn't get value. Like it doesn't look like it. Kind of looks expensive for the modern format, but with the thing you explained earlier, with like six being this magic number, there's another magic number going on in modern right now because prismatic ending coming out of MH2 made it so that like creatures that die to abrupt decay now also die to a prismatic ending. You want to be like expensive and seven toughness like right th- and there's just not very many creatures like that for modern but Murktide Regent is one of them and it's awesome in that deck so that oftentimes feels even better than Raghavan um what's the, or, the reason like Grixis decks were always such a problem for Jun decks and why they started playing like yep. Terminate again instead of Abrupt Decay is because like the fish and Tassiger are not able to be killed by half the spells in the format. So exactly when, like when the exactly. best spell was lightning bolt and the best removal spells were fatal push and abrupt decay, having a six mana, one mana, five, five uh, was good enough. And now yep. that's Murktide region. Yeah. So Murktide like has pseudo hex proof in this format, which is really interesting. Um, and so that deck is really good. I have started. So the deck, like without other people considering it, I think was just the best deck in the format. Full stop. Now that people just have seen how good it is, you're starting to play against, like, Sanctifier, Envec, and, like, Oriok Champion, and all these things that are pro-red or, like, really hard for your deck to deal with. 
And now it's in the less good of a spot, I guess I'd say. You're starting to see a lot more Chalice of the Void because the blue deck is really bad against Chalice. Um, Sanctum Prelate, too, that's also in the format, kind of the same effect. And you, you play against those things and the blue deck feels bad. And the reason I also lean towards the red-black version at this moment in time is because it's much better against those hate pieces. Um, to be clear, not just the straight red-black, but there's a, the red-black deck is splashing white off of like two shock lands or a triumph or whatever. And it's just for prismatic ending and maybe some sideboard cards. But that's enough because it answers these pro-red threats that the blue deck really struggles with. So at the moment, while people are like gearing up to beat this blue red deck, I'd much rather have the black red deck because, you know, it's better against the hate pieces people are bringing for you. And then on top of that, it just has main deck graveyard hate and Dothy Voidwalkers. So it ends up kind of beating Murktide Regent because it's really hard for them to cast it with your main deck graveyard hate. Right. You have, you have Dothy Voidwalker. You have Call Against Command being able to answer yep. every artifact under the sun. You're able to grind people out with Kroxa and Loros and Dark Confidant. Like th there's... Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is like the Jund version when you just yep. don't need green anymore because you have Dwathi Voidwalker and Luros yep. <laughs> like getting you all the, well, the, the card advantage you needed. And I, I don't think a lot of people have played with companions yet because, I mean, you mentioned this at the beginning where it's like this is these are cards that came out during quarantine. We never played with them in paper. Right. And now people are getting back. And I think a lot of people have forgot. And I, I've played against the blue red deck with the black red deck a few times. And it happens very often that we both attrition each other completely out of everything because our cards are really good at trading with each other. We both have no hand. I then pay three mana, put Luris in my hand, and the game is immediately over. They're never winning. Right, right. That's So that, that was something that... so. <laughs> Not to keep like bringing commander into modern, but uh, yeah. I like almost as a meme. So uh, for those, uh, uh, Nathan, who's Hermit Druid on Twitter, is like a CDH yep. content creator. He he uh, it made really popular the like more casual Shakashima and uh, Kodama the East Tree uh, deck that like with yep. that uses Karuga as a companion. He's like made like partner and companion three commander decks popular. And I've like been trying to make Loros work. And last night, played a game, like, grinded out the whole thing. L late game, my graveyard was really full. And then I, like, remembered I had Luros available. <laughs> and I went from, like, oh, there's no way I'm doing anything in this game. I have no cards in hand. I have no chance of, like, playing it. And be like, oh, I have I have infinite. I, like, took a 10-minute turn because I was like, I don't even know. I have so many lines available to me at this point by playing this Loros on turn six that because I've been able to get stuff into my graveyard that figuring out just what the best play is because I have this many options took me five minutes to really figure out and like yeah it's it's interesting to see where these companions even with the companion tax added to them can like be valuable in this yeah. format and the fact that stuff that is more grindy if you have the removal spells the stop the aggressive starts are available these kind of really powerful grind engines out of Loros are going to be more, more, more relevant. Okay. So I want to say, I have actually been following your pictures of this Loris deck on Twitter yeah. <laughs> and this deck is awesome. So I actually want to build it and try it. That thing looks really oh, yeah. sweet. There's definitely like cards that I need to add, like Dockside Exorcist sure. and uh, uh, yeah. Goblin Bombardment, which are just like, I don't own enough of them sure. for the amount of commander decks I have. And I can just like, I need to yeah. just buy them, but, uh, or I like, know that struggle. That's a Extortionist yeah. is a fifty dollar card, which is like yeah. a fun problem to have. Yeah, one yep. of those or seventy five percent of my like placement of Ragavans. <laughs> yeah. what's my yep. option here? Um, but yeah, no, I mean the black red one's sweet. I think this is like if I were to choose between this is more my playstyle anyways, which is the grindier like good at removal spells. Every creature you have draws a card versus the blue red deck, which is a little bit more on Ben style, which is play a threat and then play spells to make sure that threat doesn't die. <laughs> Yeah, so just a couple points on the black red deck. I want to say too, you mentioned the old companion rule, Luris. People forgot Luris was the literal best card ever printed in the history of Magic until they changed the companion rule. It got banned in Vintage. How many cards have gotten banned in Vintage for power level reasons? This card was absurd. I think zero. the companion change hurt it, but it's still really good. Yeah, I think the only because the only card that has been banned in Vintage is Shahrazad and has nothing to do with power level. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's all all the anti cards also. Were, well, yeah, but yeah, it's but, not. But yeah, those are those I don't consider a ban, right? Because that's like sure, that's sure. like this yeah. rule no longer exists in the game of Magic. Yep. These cards don't work. Yeah. Sherazad sure. is on a rules perspective totally fine in Magic and miserable. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that is fair. Um, but I will say on the black red deck, uh, one other thing that keeps surprising me about it is that Dothy Voidwalker just is always better than you think it is. Like you. 
as someone who like just reads magic cards, you're trained to like find the catch. You know what I mean? Yeah. This card is absurd. <laughs> there just wasn't one. There's no catch on it, and it's so good. It's right. so strong. So, so do you know? Do you know that we previewed the card? I did know yeah, that. Yeah. So this like, card is sick. We like read it for a good week before we were able to talk about it. Being like, there's, there's got to be something. Like, did they make graveyards worse? <laughs> Did yeah. something is there something this? is there some catch is there a negative and it's like no the mm-hmm. only negative i could find on it was you like the spells it's casting for free just have to follow their timing restrictions so right. you do have to cast sorceries at sorcery speed but it's like i get to cast it for free whatever i'll follow mm-hmm. the timing right. restrictions at, at one point i thought maybe they were printing like a zero mana shock that drew a card or something <laughs> like, sure yeah like, like what is, what is that, this like, yeah invalidates this card that's gonna be so and nope this card's just bonkers <laughs> I, I mean, I have a story. I have a story on this card. I put, first of all, before people like want to ask the question, if I was playing a SCG tomorrow and I wanted to win it, I would play this black red deck. And second, I was playing an FNM yesterday, just testing it out. I won a counter fight against blue white control game one out of my black red deck, and I have zero counters in my deck. <laughs> I just had two Dothies, and the guy, I, I have two Dothies in play, and the guy had cast an Archmage's Charm to draw two at the end of his turn, passes to me. I cast my Luris, he cryptic commands it, tapping out. I sacrifice a, da- a Dothy to Archmage's Charm, his cryptic command to counter it. He force of negations the Archmage's Charm. I say that resolves, it goes into exile from the other Dothy, and then I cast his force of negation with my second Dothy to counter his cryptic command, and my Luris resolves, and then replays one of the Dothies, and I pass the turn. And it's like, what are you supposed to do against that? Right, How? Right. How do you beat that? You don't. It's ridiculous. Lose. <laughs> yeah, you don't. You don't. You lose. Yeah. <laughs> um sweet uh yeah i was like it's wild i I guess this kind of gets to the next conversation it's wild the breath i guess okay before we get into that because there's there's two more decks i want to go over and then we have we have kind of the conversation on on the influence of modern horizons and bannings and stuff and and uh the next one is um the the kind of sacrifice combo decks the heliod yagamoth's will that that kind of world because for for basically until modern horizons heliod decks have spent like almost six months as the best deck in the format uh and now they've definitely like not disappeared but they've definitely fallen by the wayside yeah well so heliod decks before like heliod was the the murktide region before where it's like yeah there are answers in modern they can hit it but like no one's playing them so this card for all intents and purposes is like untouchable right well now they put a prismatic ending so it's a lot easier to kill it and on top of that the combo for this deck is two three mana pieces right so it's powerful certainly very strong card but well i guess i guess it's walking bliss in heliod but it's also it's more spike feeder in heliod right so it's like two three mana things and just it's that deck's ma- just yeah sorry go ahead no it's, it's, a, it's a three and a three mana thing or a three and a four mana thing basically yeah basically yeah, yeah. and it's like that deck just isn't fast enough anymore. And you, like, it was fast before because you would play Utopia Sprawl and Arbor Elf. And Utopia Sprawl is another one that really got crushed by Prismatic Ending because before, again, it was like, you know, the hexproof mana elf. Now it's like you play Utopia Sprawl and gets Prismatic Ended. And it doesn't feel great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but the other thing is, like, when on your Arbor Elf starts, like, you just aren't keeping up with the red decks and they can kill the stuff or, like, limit your damage enough to kill you with a Murktide Regent before you get your stuff online. So I think that one's just suffering from some of the other decks just being faster than it. That one just needs some other piece to get printed. I don't know what it right. looks like yet, but it needs another card to come out to kind of give it a boost. It's been really interesting in modern history to just, like, as especially as a ex birthing pod player <laughs> to watch like bl- white green creature combo and, and it be birthing pod, it be collected company, it be Heliod decks, it be just like event. Like there's always going to be like these like creatures that are good on their own that also happen to go infinite. And, and that deck has kind of always existed. And often yep. like that's another one where, it has it's a hate bears deck more often than not and and figuring mm-hmm. out what the metagame looks like and which hate bears you need to be playing to be able to stop your opponents from stopping you is going to be i think the moments that you're going to figure out when that deck is good again right is like okay yep. this like oh i need to be playing uh corn vec or whatever or i need to be doing this to be able to stop people and this to stop the other direction and, and figure it out or maybe i need to be more black based and just like run four dwathi void walkers main deck and just like be a mardu sure. version of the black red deck that's splashing this combo or you know there's different options you can go into and figuring out what that shell looks like takes time there's a reason definitely like, like birthing pod was the best deck in modern from the 
get-go in modern except it was the hardest deck to build and play and so no one figured it out for two years <laughs> like it took Definitely, years yeah. for people to be like oh this card's this deck's better than everything else even with delve being printed with treasure cruise and dig through time being legal in the format birthing pod was still the best deck in the format just because siege rhino existed <laughs> so like yeah. like it takes time for those types of decks to to settle so it'd be interesting if it needs another piece or if it's just a, a a puzzle that needs to be solved it, it could it could be either i i'm honestly not sure i have played with it though and just the the like unfair part of it before was just how just hard it was to target its stuff and that's just not there, that's anymore. Not there anymore yeah so yeah I, I don't know i'm just i'm a little off of it i i think maybe you could figure this out i'm not saying you couldn't and maybe maybe there's a build we just haven't found it yet so I, i'm not sure but um i don't like it at the current moment with the current builds i'm pretty off of it there um, in terms of creature combo, I would definitely be playing Yogg right now. Uh, there's a Yogg core deck, uh, Yogg Moth Thran Physician. It's from Modern Horizons 1, and he reads really complicated, and honestly, he doesn't look that good when you're reading him. And then, like, when you look at the deck, oh my god, does every other card in the deck look worse than Yogg, because you are playing some bad ones. You got Young Wolf, Strangleroo Geist, Thrall's Messenger, these are not modern cards. Uh, but they are in this deck because when you combine them with Yawgmoth, the deck gets really broken. And because you get to play 12 effective copies of Yawgmoth, you essentially always have it. Um, and under big, like, a little, I guess, missed part about this deck was just how powerful uh, getting Ignoble Hierarch is for the deck to make your mana better. Because the mana is really tough when you're trying to go Strangle Root Geist and Adrolf Messenger. Um, and also Yavamaya. Yavamaya matters too. That was, that was a um, big conversation the, when when Ignoble Hierarch was previewed, right? Where like a thing people were underestimating about the card existing was more just that like there's a reason creature based Bant combo or like green white combos, like another read on the green white conversation, were so good for so long. And one of them was just like on the mm -hmm. back of Igno uh, Noble Hierarch, just like it had yep. the best Birds of Paradise in the format. And this one being able to do the other colors <laughs> means that yep. randomly Yagamoth is good now. <laughs> Well, and this deck needed it, too, because, like I said, you got Young Wolf and Stringeroo guys in your deck. Giving those guys plus one, plus one when they attack matters, because they are not good brawlers. But the way the combo plays out, you really want your life total to be higher than theirs, because it makes your combo lines all a lot easier. Well, and, um, and getting, 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 um... Garoff's Messenger on turn two is significantly different than getting it on turn three. <laughs> No, you're right, because you, you physically cannot turn three somebody if you can't cast your Draw's Messenger on two in this deck, but because it's easier to cast Draw's Messenger on two, it opens up turn three kills in the deck, which is big for right, the deck. Right, right, right. Because you do need to race some decks. Um, the other big thing from that deck is Grist, which is actually one of the better removal spells in the format right now. It's one of the few things that can hit Merktide region. It can hit some of the other stuff that is problematic for the deck, and um, just being able to cord for that or Eldritch Evolution for that has been really big, so... Um, if I was playing a creature combo deck, I would play Yogg. I would warn you ahead of time that your deck is not good against Graveyard Hate. Uh, please play multiple answers in your sideboard. I would definitely play Assassin's Trophy um, and probably some combination of Rex Sage, Foundation Breaker, or Force of Vigor. But I definitely want some Assassin's Trophies. That was my big find. Um, and Endurance has also been huge for the deck. Endurance is a really nice piece for the deck because... It's just a Lotus Petal for Court of Calling, which is something that people miss. It's not even the graveyard aspect. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Yeah, that I, I will I will or credit that to uh, my friend Casey on Twitter. He, he came up with that tech, and I think it's amazing. I've been playing it, and it just so often happens that you're one green creature short of courting for lethal on the deck, and the fact that you can just zero them out at instant speed and then cord when they're not expecting it is just really powerful. Um, um, and and, and uh, I guess I'll ask this as a favor of you and then tell our editor to do this as well. And then also people listening uh, below, uh, there'll be a list of this deck list as well. Cause I know this one, this one's a little bit more on, on left field and isn't like kind of easily fun on, on uh, sites like MTG Goldfish or TCG player. So we'll, we'll sure. have a link to the deck list below. Cause this deck definitely sounds super sweet. Yeah. I can ship it if you'd like. Perfect. Uh, sorry, continue. Yeah, I mean, that, that was what I wanted with okay, it. It's, cool. um, it, like, if you're going to get into the deck, I do think the deck is very good, but it's also very difficult, and the combo lines are very convoluted. It doesn't make a lot of sense, so you will get points playing the deck where if you know the deck, you're going to have a serious information advantage of your opponent. And having played the deck myself, 
Uh, I've watched opponents like cast removal spells at very much the wrong time or not kill the right thing or just not really understand how the deck works. And that's a huge advantage for the deck. And that will, you know, lessen over time as people learn it. But there's not a lot of people playing it right now. So, you know, for the next two, three, four, five months, you got a window there to like make some serious ground with Yogg. And it's the type of deck that can keep getting better over time because, you know, the more, you know, the more creatures they print, the more this has access to them. And, you know, every green or black hate bear that you get is going to be cherished by this deck because you don't have like the wealth of white hate bears that you would in other colors. So, right, right. Uh, and then and then the last deck we're going to talk about today is uh, Elementals. OK, <laughs> Elementals was just a meme before I remember watching somebody stream with it. I think I think it was Edgar Magalhães. Uh, and it was the funniest thing ever because it was so bad and we were just like, I don't know, it was just a joke. And then all of a sudden they printed five pitch spell elemental creatures that just work <laughs> with this deck and now all of a sudden it's a real deck. Uh, it's weird how that, yeah. that works. You print uh, a series of extraordinarily powerful free creatures all at the same creature type and that creature type gets better. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing with it before was like, I don't know, I'm sure you've played against Risen Reef and Commander. Yes. That's not really a fun experience nope. uh, when someone's going off with Risen Reef and Commander. No, that thing goes crazy. So this deck has this ridiculous late game from Risen Reef. You're playing four of them, and it goes kind of nuts. You're also playing Omnath, which kind of does the same thing. It goes crazy. Right. Um, so the deck always had that, and it had a, a surprisingly good late game for a creature-based strategy in Modern. But it was just slow. It was clunky. You didn't have good, cheap elementals, and they weren't doing the things you wanted them to do. Not, now you have zero mana spells that are just excellent, right. and they don't even lose card advantage. Like the the big problem with the deck or with with those spells, why they're not seeing even more play than they are, is that you are two for one yourself to get their effect. Well, when you know when this two for one yourself comes with oh, you also get a coiling oracle trigger. Like now, all of a sudden, these cards are just not even fair at all. They're just so broken. So, so, so for listeners, I think the deck's real. Sorry, uh, for, for listeners, Risen Reef is one green blue elemental 1-1. One, one. Uh, when Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you put it into the battlefield. If it's a uh, not a land card, you put it into your hand. So it's Coiling Oracle, uh, but it triggers any time it or an elemental plays. And because the incarnations are elementals, when you cast them for free, they still enter the battlefield. So you're able to trigger Risen Reef with the pitch ability. So now that even though you exiled a card from your hand, you're either ramping or drawing a card and getting the effect from, from discarding the thing. So you're able to just like put together a free advantage card engine. That is uh, a lot of value. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the problem before too, this deck is Risen Reef is a one, one. So it was just really vulnerable to everything basically. Um, and, but now I've played against this deck in the format and you're just kind of like, your opponent doesn't do anything for the first two turns and you're kind of like, uh, what are they doing? Like, I mean, but I'm just going to play my stuff. I'll be way ahead. They're never coming back. And then they're like risen reef pitch spell, kill your whole board with fury pitch spell, like grief or whatever. Take your card out of your hand, draw a card, pitch spell, endurance, get rid of your graveyard, go. And you're like, what just happened? That was a ridiculous <laughs> turn. I'm so far behind now. How do I ever win? You're like, oh, I didn't realize I was playing against Storm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what is this? What is going on? <laughs> yep. That's sweet. All right. So that that those are the decks we, uh, we wanted to talk about today. Uh, the the last thing, and I, I, this will be a brief conversation because I think I think we're we're running out of time, and uh, this could be a whole episode on its own, to be totally honest. But uh, just kind of a quick conversation on what your thoughts are. Just like on the influence of Modern Horizons, do cards need to be banned? Are there specific cards you would point out as things that you're worried about being banned? Or do you think uh, like so far, because from my perspective, yes, there is a ton of power level that's been added to the format, but it's been other than maybe one or two outliers, pretty flat in its dominance of the format. You don't have just like mm -hmm. one deck is just better than everything else. And like, you even have weird stuff where like people are figuring out, Oh, like, Oh, elementals in Yagamoth decks are actually really good right now and haven't even gotten a chance to start showing off. Yeah. So if, from my perspective, I am so far away from wanting anything from modern horizons to banned. It's not even close. I am sick of stuff getting banned. And one of the, the like hallmarks for me of like, does a fair card, like a, a fair ish card need to be banned in modern is, is it just in one deck? Like, are we looking at something that was just so broken with some interaction that this is just the only way to do it, right? Like, Hogak was like, well, you know, you built the best Hogak deck, that was the best Hogak deck, and Hogak was just so broken, there's no reason to do anything else. Like, that was right. the thing. And it wasn't like you are seeing other decks pick up Hogak. With the cards people are talking about in this, 
like Urza Saga, yes, it's a powerful card, but it's going in wildly diverse strategies, and it's very exploitable if you want. Like, you know, my red black deck, I'm splashing some wear tears in the sideboard, and I'm just delighting, just wearing uh, Urza Saga when they play it on turn one. It's like so one minute stoner. This is awesome. Have, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying this much more than you are at this point. Um, and Ragavan's kind of the same way. Like, yes, it is a very powerful card. I would never argue that it isn't, but it's going in a bunch of different archetypes. And at the end of the day, it's a one mana creature that you kind of have to untap with. I guess you have the dash, but you kind of have to untap with it. So, all right, if Ragavan's too good, you play removal. Like, that's just what you do. Right. And then that's fine. Everything. And like, yeah, it, the fact that it's an X2, like, it, honestly, I, it, like, jokingly, because because the comparison to me on uh, uh, Ragavan is 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 Deathrite Shaman. And like, yep, because they're very similar, right? They're they're almost that, off fair. color mana dorks that create advantage. And but to me, the fact that it's a two one versus a one two almost makes the world a difference to me <laughs> because yeah. literally everything kills kills it versus Death Ray Shaman, yeah. where they're definitely like I'm a dredge deck and I want to be able to whatever the dredge card is that does one, minus one minus one to a thing for one black. And I'm like, oh, this doesn't do anything. I'm dead. I want to play gut shot to maybe answer their one drop to get advantage and versus their like an advantage engine doesn't work. And against this card, it just dies everything. And and to your point, like you can block it. <laughs> yeah. Just like play more arboreal grazers. And like, I was going to say the last amulet, the last amulet league I played on MTGO, I just put four arboreal grazers in my deck and I was just clowning Ragavan decks because they just couldn't detect them. Oh, three. And then they'd have to sit there like, am I going to bolt this O3? Am I really going to do it? And then they do. And it just feels awesome. But that, that's cool. Like that's healthy magic. Yep. Like, th these aren't the cards that need banned. They're, like the cards you need banned are just so oppressive. They beat everything, and nothing is that dominant right now. I mean, there are good decks, there are tier one decks, but there's nothing that like I have not played against a single deck where I played against it, and I was like, "What was I ever supposed to do?" Like that's how I felt against Hogak. You played against Hogak, and you're like, "I have a turn two rest in peace in my hand on the draw," which is like what you want. And they have 15 power in play when I cast my Hogak. Like, was I ever able right. to do anything? No, I I couldn't have done anything at any point. These cards are like, yeah, yeah, they're good, but like figure it out like you don't need wizards to answer everything with a banning when you can just play removal spells that answer them you know what i mean yeah i think i think like yeah i think the the two situations where car bans are like necessary and like sometimes they should happen but like yeah and that that's a different issue but like where they're like oh we need to do something now or this format's going to have problems are what you just described which is basically what hogak summer was and what eldrazi winter was and yep. and and if we want to make all of the seasons happen treasure cruise fall <laughs> sure <laughs> um, where it's like these cards exist and there's nothing i can do against it to really be able to compete and uh, yep. like and and i shouldn't <laughs> i should just play hogak um yep. or i should just figure out a different a, a different version of the eldrazi shell the other one is is misery game states right and that's kind of like what happened with field of the dead as a good example where it's sure. like yeah. this card is both ubiquitous and creates game states that are miserable and like it, you can have decks that are are unfun to play against. I am, I am not here to hate against control decks. I'm fine with stacks decks existing. I'm fine with mono black pox decks to exist. In fact, some of my best legacy runs are with mono black pox. But sure. the like when Field of the Dead was showing up in every deck, no matter what, because it was easy to splash. It cost you nothing. The mana bases in modern were diverse enough where you're just eventually going to start making zombies. And then like any grindy deck on the planet could never win a game. That yep. creates an un unfun environment and. I don't think that's either. I also don't think that's happening here. Like that, that was a little bit was I afraid with Urza saga when it first showed up or was like, Oh, is this another field of the dead problem? Like this is an, a very difficult to answer threat, which ends up. It's not because <laughs> it's <Yep>. an enchantment. <laughs> uh, but that, it, that was the thing about all of these. That was really smart. Like they put a ton of power into these cards. They definitely did. These cards are powerful, but they put them on a delay effect. Like Ragavan, you need to untap with Urza saga. The first chapter doesn't do anything. You kind of got to untap with it. And, yeah, it's powerful, but like you get, you're giving the opponent a window. They can't interact with it. If they don't, well, you know, maybe that's their fault. Maybe like it, it's certainly a powerful card, but it's within the realm of modern's power, in my opinion. Right, and and that's like I think that is why if I were to like pick a card, and I don't, I don't want it to be banned. A, because this is like the exact like my the sadness with Ho the Hogak ban was like. If Hogak was just powerful enough to stay in the format, but not powerful enough to be banned, it would. It's the deck I would be playing. Like I am here for a Vengevine sure. variant whenever it's available. So I don't want Asmore to go away. Uh, it's doing everything I like that Magic does. Uh, 
to the extent that I have like eight commander decks that are all basically that deck. Um, <laughs> that's but that's like true. the 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 board state that it creates is the one that's the most troubling of these because I don't think I don't think a two one that creates card advantage is a is 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 too scary. I don't think Dragon Rage Channeler is. I don't think Urza Saga. Urza Saga seems to be creating six different new decks, which is cool. I don't sure. think the Cascade effects like. Like it, it, all of these effects seem to be creating a diversity of the metagame, which is exactly what you want. And none of them seem to be coming out on top to the extent that literally in the last four weeks, what the best deck is went from food decks to Titan decks to blitz decks to hammer time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's been, it, that's healthy churn. Like that's what you want to see from a modern format. You want to see these decks climbing up over each other. And this just looks great. And to your point on like, if we had to pick a ban, I mean, if you want to ban, I can give you a ban. If people want to ban something, let's get Mishra's Bobble out of here. Because yes, this yes. card is just, what is this? It's, <laughs> it's the dumbest card. I mean, look, I don't I don't want to go into it. Because I, I guess some people like playing with the card. And it's certainly powerful. But it's just not a card that, that like... Okay, so nobody loves this card. Like, when you think about, I want to go play Magic, I might enjoy playing with Ragavan. Ragavan's a cool experience. It creates interesting game states. The same could be said with Urza Saga or... Asmo, like, okay, maybe maybe they're strong, but they do create interesting play experiences. Bobble just, you don't need it. It's just a piece of cardboard that moves between zones and, like, intrinsically is just free, and it's just free enabling, and it's like, I was going to ban something. I'd look at, like, the dumb stuff that's, like, just free and, like, not really doing any, like, it is fair. It's kind of fair, but it's, like, not fair at the same time, too. And it kind of has very strong Ataxian Probe ba- or vibes, which is, like, yeah, when you're starting to compare to Gitaxian Probe, like let, let's get you out of here. Let's go send you to the legacy format and let you live over there. There's there is there is precedent for it, which I think I love about one banning a card. Like, oh yes, other free cantrips have also been banned. Getting rid of this does not surprise me. It also like I definitely have said on the podcast that I was sad that before they changed the rule that they like kind of did the Hogak thing where they like banned cards hoping to make companions not as like if yeah, they banned cards hoping to make like companions not as good. So like trying to like hurt Loros without banning the new card, but they learned their lesson where like because they got rid of bridge, right? Like banned bridge, yep. like hoping that would get rid of Hogak, but it didn't. They could have banned Bobble then. I don't think anyone would have been sad. <laughs> no, no one no one's gonna be sad. And th- that's the other thing about this card is like I- I've never seen anybody that thought this play experience was good because invariably with Bobble, it's either one like powering up stuff like a turn before they should be in or like just making delirium too easy. It's also like making your opponent touch your cards and like look at your deck, which is like not really that fun for you, like having your cards touched and looked at where you don't get to like be part of that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, it has the like the worst templating ever of you have to draw the card in their upkeep, which just creates awful feel bads for new players because that's a really hard trigger to remember and Mm -hmm. they never remember it. And then they just miss and they just, it's just feel bad. It feels really bad for them. So it's like, I don't know what this card is doing that anybody actually like needs it to be here. So why don't we just throw it out? Like it would power down all of the, it powers down all of the cards that people are complaining about. Urza Saga gets worse. Um, cause you can't just draw a free cantrip off of it. I guess you maybe still could, but it still gets worse. Um, you know, the, the artifact Asmo decks, you know, Asmo doesn't use it, but all the other pieces in the deck use it. And then Luris gets worse. Um, or Dragon Race Chandler gets way worse without Bobble. So there, there's just a whole bunch of reasons where it's like, it's powering down the stuff people are talking about being too powerful, but also like, if I ban this card, you're also not out the $400 you spent on Ragavons, right? right like you still right. get to keep your Mythic you bought. Well, and, and that card's going to be good as long as it's legal and modern forever and, and in other formats for a long time. Like, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Bobble. I mean, Michael has always also said, uh, like, Cold Snap was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I, I can get behind that. That's a weird set. Um, Very strange. Bobble is a great example of it. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this. Uh, if, if we're picking a card, all right, I'm, a, I'm down to put that officially in, in paper. Bobble is, is this podcast episode's claim to card that if you need to ban a card, is the card to get rid of. But I, I, I think I agree more with the original point of like right now, especially. I don't think anything needs to be banned. I don't. Yeah, think, I, don't I think agree with you. I agree. Yeah, I think, I think we're we. A, the metagame hasn't shuffled in any way that makes it like like even knowable what the best card in the format is. The most egregious things that are happening are like relatively fair. Yeah. And like I like I think I guess like the most powerful thing we talked about tonight was like turn three Emerkles. 
And it's like, that, yeah, I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. But it's like, it's like a lot of work. <laughs> I will, I will say when you get uh Colossus hammered on the ink moth, that doesn't feel great, but fair, fair. Th- and that is powerful. But yeah, I mean, whatever, that's something you could like, you just need a rule spell. You're good. But that's another you like know? Mishra bobble maybe cuts down. Like, I, like it would be so weird if Urza saga gets banned because of hammer time. I would be yeah. I, I would be mad. I agree. That's, <laughs> that's a, that would be an interesting banning. I would I would love to read the Ian Duke article on Monday. Yeah, we thought Harris was too good. We banned Urza Saga. Like I, I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> there's no. Yeah, well, just, yeah, that would be an awesome article though. I, I would be I would just be all for that. Oh, like of crack all, it up. All the decks we've talked about, the most powerful thing you could do with it is put. Just you're guaranteed to get Colossus Hammer into play. Yep. That, yeah. The uncommon from draft that was not playable ever. But yeah, I mean, here we are. I mean, just for ma- magic history, maybe it's worth doing it. All right. <laughs> um, so that that is, I, I believe that'll be it for, for, unless you have anything else you want to bring up. Uh, I think that'll be it for the night. We're at like an hour and a half. So I think it's a perfect, perfect cutoff nah. point. Uh, before we sign off, where 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 is the best place people can find you online? So uh, if you want to find me, mostly I'm just on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at A22EN. Um, I also make YouTube videos from time to time. Uh, my YouTube channel is called R-I-W space makes space magic. So it's R-I-W makes magic. Uh, and I've just been doing it for my team. So I've been putting videos up from people from the R-I-W team. Um, and yeah, uh, it's not it's not like a diehard super all the time YouTube channel, but I, you know, when I play a league of moto, I'll record it and throw it up there. And you know, people want to watch and comment on my deck or if they want to ask me to play decks and see how I play them. then you're welcome to do that too. And always happy to discuss stuff on Twitter. I'm pretty active out there. So you can generally find me there. Awesome. And, and thank you so much for jumping on. It was great. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I, like I said, I've been a big fan of this cast since you guys started. Actually, I think I found you guys in like 2014 or 2015 nice. or something. I've been back in the day I've been listening ever since. So <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, a while, but uh, no, there was a time where I was like, I just loved modern when I started and you guys were putting out the best content and I just, just thank you know, you. had you on the download and always listened. So yeah, we've, it's, it's crazy that this podcast has existed for almost six years. It is. It's wild. There <laughs> are not like very many insane. podcasts that make it that long. I'll be honest. Oh yeah. Well, there's not a lot of things that make it that long. Like as far as Th- that's true. That content is true. in general, humans last yeah. that long, and pets, some of them. Uh, this is getting dark. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right. So uh, before we sign off, once again, thank you, patrons. Uh, for those who don't know, we have a Patreon. Uh, it's how it's one of the main ways we we fund this podcast. If you go check that out, uh, we have a uh, whole pre-show before every episode, about ten minutes at minimum uh, of content. Uh, that's extra about a bunch of different stuff today we talked about the witcher um so definitely check that out if you want it's on patreon uh we also have uh, and it comes out a week early so we're recording this on tuesday it'll be out hopefully by thursday normally it comes out on wednesday uh versus waiting all the way till next monday so you get on the on the dot relevant information sometimes we say stuff and it's no longer true but if you listen to patreon it would be true when you heard it uh also if we swear it's on there so if you want that (laughs) or any mistakes we make uh we also make sure to hit that tcg player link below doesn't cost you anything just click on it and uh we get credit for it at some point in the future which is really dope and then we also do monday night commander streams now uh the videos if you were watching them before are now posted on the kes games youtube channel so if you check that out it's where top decking is it's where a lot of the old masters of modern episodes are uh and we just realized that like youtube algorithms like when this channel is about modern and then so we wanted to make that kind of more of the commander place and we tonight if you're listening or watching this on monday night are uh doing the place that uh, Marshall is out. So we have uh, Tappy Toe Claws filling in. So it'll be Tappy, me, Ben, and Michael. And we're all brewing new commanders from uh, the Forgotten Realm set. Uh, so they're all brand new decks brewing around. Uh, I think I'm going to play... Actually, I have no idea. I know I know Michael is playing the, the mono blue legend from the commander set because I think he helped make it. So that's really cool. But uh, we'll, we'll see what that we're playing. That is really cool. Um, and that's a big flex. Playing a commander you designed yourself. That's awesome. Yes, yes. I think he's really hyped. <laughs> he was that like... That is awesome. I like did the, sh- the like share out text to to uh, Tappy Ben and me because we're, we're having her fill in. So we had to make a new text sure. group. And like, she was like, hi. And he was like, I'm playing Mill. <laughs> I'm playing this character. And we were like, <laughs> didn't even say hello. <laughs> it's just like, making sure he had dibs i'm like okay (laughs) sick um so yeah so make sure to check that out it's gonna be a blast and and once again zach thanks so much for coming on uh and and being part of this podcast this week and hope you have you on again and thank you all for listening talk to you guys next week see you guys bye this has been a production of time traveler media sending podcasts into
to the future.